Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Joseph Cotton in George Bernard Shaw's Cashel Byron's Profession on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. Tonight on our Hallmark Playhouse, we present a very great name indeed, George Bernard Shaw. And the story of his we are dramatizing is Cashel Byron's Profession, a novel which Shaw wrote when he was a young man, and that, you know, was a very long time ago, for he died only last year at the wonderful old age of 94. Shaw, of course, is best known for his plays and his wit, and perhaps he was just being witty when, as a successful playwright, he said, quote, I never think of Cashel Byron's profession without a shudder at the narrowness of my escape from being a successful novelist at the age of 26, unquote. Well, anyhow, Cashel Byron makes a good and gallant hero, and his profession, in case you want to know in advance, was prize fighting with boxing gloves. A fairly new profession in those days, for most people then could remember when all prize fighting had been with bare fists, and the fighters often battered each other for hours in the ring without a pause. To play Cashel Byron tonight, we are fortunate indeed to have with us that fine actor, Joseph Cotton. And now here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you're looking for a way to say something to someone you care for, look for a Hallmark card and you'll find the right words. Because Hallmark Cards are designed to say what you want to say, the way you want to say it, and in the good taste you demand of anything that bears your personal signature. That's why Hallmark on the back of a greeting card has come to mean... You cared enough to send the very best. And now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting George Bernard Shaw's Cashel Byron's Profession, starring Joseph Cotton. The young gentleman who has just entered the star's dressing room is not the star. He seems restless, out of place, as he saunters about the strange surroundings. There's a clutter of women's clothing, open makeup jars, spilled powder. On the dressing table stands a framed photograph of a boy in an Eton collar. Moodily, the young man looks at the picture. To Mama, with love, Casho. <laughs> and the lad with the Eton collar stares up through a splintered picture frame from the bottom of a wastebasket. Up there on the stage, the curtain's going down, and the applause, so crisp across the footlights, sound dead and sodden in the dressing room. Oh, oh did you like it, really? I was in a dither when Reggie didn't give me the cue. <laughs> See you later, darling. Kershaw. Hello, Mother. Why, Kershaw, what a pleasant surprise. Oh, Kershaw, what are you doing way up in the air like that? I beg your pardon? Well, you've grown so tall and... It's so big. There's very little I can do about it, Mother. Yes, of course. It's, it's just the shock of seeing you after such a long time. How have you been, dear? Reasonably well. Mother, I have something very important to oh, tell you. Oh, I know, I know you have so many things, but they can wait until I get this nasty grease paint off my face. Hmm? Mother. Oh, do you realize, Casual? I don't believe I've seen you since the time you ran off from Dr. Moncrief's school. Oh. Really, Cashel, I was so disturbed I could barely go on. The management almost had to cancel the performance. I'm truly sorry it upset you. It wasn't your running off that bothered me as much as... Uh, um, well, uh, was it necessary for you to knock out the two front teeth of your geometry, Professor? It was a very geometric punch. Oh, really, Cashel, you can't just go through life hitting people. You've got to settle on a profession. I've already settled on one. Oh, splendid. What is it, Cashel? Bookkeeping? Or would you like to have me set you up in a small establishment? Yard goods or something, I'm huh? not going to tell you what my profession is because you wouldn't approve. And I've come to say goodbye, Mother. 
I'm going to Australia. You don't mean Australia? Down there by the South Pole. Kangaroos and things. It's a growing country, Mother. I don't understand you, Cashel. You never have. So far from home. Home? What home? Cashel. Oh, it's not your fault, Mother. You've had your work, the theater. I know how demanding it is. You've done your best for me. Schools, tutors, spending money. I don't want to seem ungrateful. Why, my dear boy. I'm not your dear boy. You'll find him in the wastebasket, what's left of him. Oh. I doubt very much if you will ever see me again. Cashel! Don't be dramatic, Mother. You'll travel lighter without me. There's no baggage less needful to a leading lady than a grown-up son. Boy! You, sweeping up the gymnasium! You talking to me? How come I've never seen you before? Well, I've only been here a few weeks. I just arrived in Australia. Uh, put down that broom for a second. Well, what's on your mind? Uh, try punching this bag once. I'd like to put that arm of yours to more use than shoving a broom handle. Certainly. Want me to hit it hard? Yes. Hit it as hard as you can. All right. <coughs> hit it again. <coughs> Think I can punch? Lad, I've been looking for you for 20 years. My name's Mellish. How do you do? Once I had the champion of the world. I'm a trainer and manager and builder of champions. But since old Ned passed on, I haven't found me the stuff of another champion. Uh, how'd you like to be it? Be what? Champion of the world. I want to make boxing my profession. <laughs> well, I've never heard it called a profession before, but the way you hit, Sonny, you call it anything you want to. How's that, Mr. Mellish? It's too blame good, boy. You wore out another punching bag. That's a good fight, wasn't it, Mr. Mellish? Terrible. People won't fight to see a fight like that. Never knock out your opponent before round three. Cash boy, a right and a left. Now, uppercut. Now, uncork that right jab. Ladies and gents, the winner and new light heavyweight champion of the world, Cash Boy! Cashel, my boy, you cleaned up every fighting man east and west of the Southern Cross. Time we went home. I don't have a home. Well, to England, man. I don't want to go. But, Cash, I've already scheduled a match. We have our passage in the most delightful country home in Great Britain where we can train for it. I won't go. You've got to go. You're in the boxing business. I oh, beg your pardon. Profession. And you've got to go where the bouts call you. We're off to England, Cash, my boy. <laughs> It's not a bad place, Mellish. Who owns this estate? A woman. Name of Lydia Carew. A woman with ice in her veins, they tell me. Oh. She lives in the big house on the hill. Let's make sure we always take our runs in the other direction. That's all right with me. Well, I'll pop in and get you a warm shirt and we'll go for a run. It's getting a little cold out for you to be just in boxing shorts. Now, don't you wander off. Don't worry. Who's that? Oh, I beg your pardon. I was walking in the woods and I'm afraid I got lost. I leave at once. No. Please don't go. When I first saw you standing there in the sunshine, I thought you were a statue. Oh, forgive my attire or lack of it. But as you see, I'm quite alive. Yes. So you are. I must say that as you emerged from the trees, I thought you were a forest goddess. You are genuine and alive, aren't you? Quite. Oh, please, before you go, tell me what your name is. I... Oh, uh, permit me to introduce myself. My name is Cashel Byron. Ah, yes. You are here for your help. Oh, is that what they told you? Yes. Although I can't imagine what could be wrong with your help. From appearances. You must tell me your name. 
Nadia Carew. Oh. Good day to you, Mr. Cashel. Bye. Good day, Miss Lydia Carew. Here's your shirt, Cash. Now let's go for our run. Yes. Well, what's the matter with you? Have you seen a ghost? No. A spirit. A forest sprite. The loveliest creature in the whole world. Mellish, don't let anyone here know that I'm a fighting man. I don't think she'd like it. She? Who's she? I've just met Miss Lydia Carew. Oh, deliver us from evil. Mellish, you've seen a lot of the world. Is it possible for a man to fall in love quite suddenly, at, say, in 15 seconds? Cashel, let me tell you something. I know fighters. I've been training them for 30 years. And there are three things that can spoil any good boxer. A Charlie horse, a weak left jab, and a beautiful woman. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Cashel Byron's Profession, starring Joseph Cotton. Have you ever analyzed what it is about a picture that makes you like it? Is it the composition and line, the colors and the way the artist combines them, the subject matter? Probably each of us looks for a different thing. But in the final analysis, I think we'll all agree that those pictures we like best are the ones where the artist has expressed something that has meaning for us as individuals. And when you select a picture to represent you, as most of us do when we select our Christmas cards, it's good to have time to make a choice leisurely and with care, to be sure it does represent your taste in art and your feelings about Christmas. The Hallmark Christmas card album has many reproductions of paintings by fine artists. This is the Hallmark Gallery Artist Collection. In it, you'll see works by Norman Rockwell, Winston Churchill, Grandma Moses, and other equally famous and outstanding artists. Each painting is magnificently reproduced in colors that are true to the originals. And each card is made in the tradition of Hallmark craftsmen, whose one purpose is to make a card you'll be proud to send and that will be received with pleasure. That's why right now, while you can make your selection leisurely, is the time to order your personalized Christmas card. Order it from the album with Hallmark on the cover. Then you'll be sure your cards will have that Hallmark on the back, which tells your friends you cared enough to send the very best. Now back to James Hilton and the second act of Cashel Byron's Profession, starring Joseph Cotton. When the prize fighter meets the lady, we can expect a very interesting bout to take place, especially with Bernard Shaw as the referee. In fact, the muscular Mr. Cashel Byron seems to be losing interest in his punching bags and developing instead a keen desire to spend his professional hours with the unpredictable Miss Lydia Carew. Miss Lydia. Oh. Forgive me for intruding on your garden, but I had to see you again. Pray sit down. I was just idling away the time, tossing pebbles into the pool. Watch. Look at the widening rings. Vibrations, the scientists call them. And they're the same, they say, as the twinkling stars. Or the pulsations of chords of music. Yes. I've been inquiring about you, Mr. Cashel Byron. You have? What have you found? They tell me you're a student. Oh, a student? But I haven't been able to find out of what? Science. I'm a student of science. Physical or uh, moral science? Uh, physical science. But there's more moral science in it than people might think. Oh, I'm fascinated by science. I wish I could do experiments with my own hands. For a master science thoroughly, I believe one must take one's gloves off. Is that your opinion? Well, I think you can become a very good scientist by working with the gloves on. I'm afraid I must go. I should be working out. Working out? What a strange expression. Do you mean uh, working outdoors in contrast to working indoors? No, I... Look, Miss Lydia, I am always saying stupid things. I'm a blunt man, I'm afraid. I will be blunt now. Miss Lydia, are you engaged for this evening? I fear that I am, Mr. Byron. I'm attending Lady Hoskins' literary soiree. May I see you there? 
I have a companion. Mr. Lucian Weber. I see. Forgive me for being unduly forward. Good day, Miss Lydia. Mellish, come here. What do you want? Uh, Cash, what are you doing dressed up like a stuffed owl? Well, help me tie this blasted black tie and stop asking questions. Where are you going? I'm going to a party, Mellish, to a soiree. A what? A soiree at Lady Huskins. Were you invited? I'm going anyway. To see if I can stay on my two feet in their kind of ring. You can announce tonight's bout officially. The prize fighter meets the lady. <laughs> more apparent when you consider this monograph in relation to Professor Abnogatti's earlier works. Don't you agree? Oh, yes. Very true. Very true. Lydia, do you agree? Agree? Agree with what? You are not listening to me. When we are married, my dear, I shall expect you to remember that profound thoughts deserve profound attention. Of course, Lucian, I shall try to remember. My dear Lydia, what are you staring at? That tall gentleman standing in the corner. Why, I've never seen him before. How curious that Lady Hoskins should invite a total stranger. He was not invited. Really? Would you consider him handsome? Oh, what a bizarre question, Lydia. Please answer it. Oh, well, perhaps in the sense that an ox might be considered handsome. Oh, I believe he hurt you. He's coming this way. Oh, dear. Good evening, Miss Carroll. How do you do, Mr. Barnes? Mm -hmm. This is my escort, Mr. Lucian Weber. Oh, 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 how do you do? Are you enjoying the party, Mr. Byron? Well, if you wish a polite answer, I would say, yes, indeed, I am enjoying myself very much. But, frankly... I am thoroughly bored. Then you must meet our guest of honor, Professor W. Abengasi of Vienna. A fascinating... With all due respect, Miss Carew, I must beg to differ. I've been listening at the fringe of his conversation, and I believe that Professor Abengasi is the most boring person here. Well, uh, present company accepted, sir. Well, culture is like eating lobster. One must be educated to enjoy. Absurd, Mr. Weber. Education has nothing to do with culture, or lobsters, for that matter. Really? Then how is one to master culture, except as one strides after the distant light, struggles toward the star of knowledge? You're raising your voice, Lucian. Well, I feel it is my duty to show this uninvited puppy how out of place he is in intellectual surroundings. You call yourself intellectuals? I don't think there is a cultured or educated person in this room. Oh, well, really? Me? Nobody here wants to learn because you want everybody to think that you all know everything already. Oh, and as for the, all this striving and struggling, it's the worst way you could set about doing anything. Really, sir, you've gone far enough. I say that nothing can be done properly if it's done with an effort. If a thing can't be done light and easy, steady and certain, it shouldn't be done at all. The more effort you make, the less effect you produce. A violinist once told me that when he laid a tight hold on his fiddlestick, or even set his teeth hard together, he could do nothing but rash. Oh, How much more of this nonsense are we going to endure? Oh, you think it's nonsense, do you? Well, take a look at that so-called painting hanging there on the wall. See that fellow in armor? St. George and the dragon, or whatever he is. He's jumped down from his horse to fight that other fellow. The lady in the gallery is half crazy with anxiety for St. George, and well, she might be. There's a posture for a man to fight in. His weight isn't resting on his legs. One touch of a child's finger would upset him. Look at his neck, craned out in front of him. And his face as flat as a full moon toward his man, inviting him to shut up both eyes with one blow. He doesn't know how to fight. He's all strain and stretch. Isn't it his ease? He carries the weight of his body as foolishly as one of the ladies here would carry a heart of bricks. He doesn't understand the universal principle that ease and strength, effort and weakness go together. I believe your theories are manifestly absurd. Then suppose you, Mr. Lucian Weber, wanted to hit me the most punishing blow you possibly could. How would you do it? Well, you'd probably make a great effort. What would happen? You'd exhaust all your strength in one blow. Whereas if you took it easy, like this, now there, it's like pocketing a billiard ball. Lucian! Lucian, are you all right? Get up! Mr. Byron, I consider you a brute. I think you are a horrible man. My apologies, Miss Carew. It appears I've won my point, but lost the fight. <laughs> Lady 
dear, I can't for the life of me understand why you made me bring you to this low place, a boxing match, Rand. I just had to find out what the man's profession was like. Lydia, I do believe you're infatuated with the fellow. I consider him a brute. What is that, Lucian? The enclosure with the ropes and posts. That? Oh, that's the ring. Not a ring, it's a square. Oh, they call it the ring. They have succeeded in squaring the circle. <laughs> Very amusing, Lucian. Oh, I say, the fight's about to begin, Lydia. Now, are you certain you want to stay? Quite certain. Oh, oh I see. Look at that. What a close. They're hurting him. Oh, Lucian, take me home. Please, take me home. I'm very sorry, sir. I have orders not to admit you. But I must see Miss Carew. But I have strictest orders, Mr. Byron. I have no intention of using violence, but you may force me... I see, me... Mr. Byron, Ashville. I don't want you to be injured carrying out my orders. Oh, very well, Miss Carew. Uh, will you be safe with him, Miss? Quite. You may leave, Ashville. Uh, very well, Miss. Thank you for seeing me. It was not my wish. Miss Lydia, I found out that you came to see me fight. I did. I had intended that you should never know my profession. And now that you do, I stand before you humbly, asking that you consider me a man, but not a monstrosity. A man who loves you. You must not speak so. I think the reason I love you, Miss Lydia, is that you're the only person who is not afraid of me. Other people are civil because they don't dare to be otherwise. It's a lonely thing to be a champion. It is also a lonely thing to be a very rich woman. People are afraid of my wealth and what they call my learning. We have at least one experience in common. Now do me a great favor by leaving. We have nothing further to say. May I never see you again? Never at all? Well, without end, amen? Never as a famous prize fighter. Miss Lydia, I have given up fighting. I will never fight again. Mr. Barr, you would do this for me? Yes, Miss Lydia, for you. And because nobody will fight with me anymore. That's another disadvantage to excelling in my particular profession. You put yourself out of business by scaring away the competition. I'm retiring of necessity and love. Oh, Mr. Byron. I plan to have one more fight with you, Miss Lydia. With me? I intend to score a technical knockout and carry you to the altar. Mr. Byron, since I saw you fight, I've been studying the jargon and general vocabulary of your profession. Mr. Byron... I throw in the towel. Five years, ten years cannot completely change a man. Cashel Byron is the retired and undefeated champion of the world. His profession? Well, he's still a fighter. There are no ropes on the ring where he fights now, and the floor isn't made out of canvas. But it's still possible to score a knockout blow now and then. And I ask that every member of this parliament give consideration to the grave consequences of the law, which my worthy opponents have so carelessly and fruitlessly proposed. I thank you. Cashel. Cashel. It was a splendid speech, darling. Thank you, my dear. Do you know, I'm convinced that my husband is the best fighter in the entire House of Commons. <laughs> After all, it's my profession, Lydia. At last, I have found an area of fisticuffs where there is never a shortage of challenges. The magnificent boxing ring we call Parliament. Big Ben sounds the gong for every round, and the victor's crown goes not to the man who is able to stay on his feet, but to the one who can keep his seat. <laughs> the same rules apply. Break clean, Never hit below the belt. Kiss me, Cashel. And always do what your trainer tells you. Cotton and James Hilton will return in a moment. Part of the magic of Christmas is that the more you think of others, the deeper your own joy. 
That's why I mentioned a few moments ago that right now is the time to select your Christmas cards for personal imprinting, if you'd like them to reflect the thoughtfulness of the season. And if you'd like them to be a true expression of your own good taste. I suggest that you ask to see the Hallmark album of Christmas cards at the fine store where you buy all your Hallmark cards. For surely at Christmas you want your cards to be the one your friends will receive with pleasure and display proudly all during the holidays. And you want to know that when they turn your card over, as they're sure to do, they'll see that Hallmark on the back and know immediately that you cared enough to send the very best. Here again is James Hilton. Joseph Cotton, that was a wonderful performance you gave us tonight as George Bernard Shaw's Cashel Byron. We are so happy to have had you with us again. Well, it was a particular treat for me, Jimmy. You know, some time ago, I was rehearsing for a stage version of this same story. You know what happened? During those rehearsals, I met a girl. And tonight, I find myself acting again in that very same story on our 20th wedding anniversary. Well... Congratulations, Joe. It is a most fortunate occasion, and I'm more than ever happy that you could be with us. Thank you, Jimmy. You know, as a matter of fact, I'm always happy to appear on the Hallmark Playhouse because I think you and the makers of Hallmark Cards are both doing a good job. You, by selecting stories for all family listening, and Hallmark Cards for making it easier for all of us to be more thoughtful of other people, and that's important, believe me. That's a very fine compliment, Joe, and I'm sure the makers of Hallmark Cards appreciate it as much as I do. Thank you for all of us. Uh, what story have you selected for next week, Jimmy? Next week, our story will be Catherine Drinker Bowen's John Adams and the American Revolution, the inspiring story of a man who helped shape the destiny of America when it was young. And as our star, we are very happy to welcome back Van Heflin. Our Hallmark Playhouse is every Thursday. Our producer-director is Bill Gay. Our music is composed and conducted by David Rose. And our story tonight was dramatized by Lawrence and Lee. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. The role of Lydia tonight was played by Lorene Tuttle. Mrs. Byron was B. Benaderet. Lucian was played by Joseph Kearns and Mellish by Ben Wright. We hope you of the Hallmark Playhouse audience who live in television cities will consult your local paper for time and station of our new television show. Hallmark Cards presents Sarah Churchill. Miss Churchill introduces you to outstanding world personalities in the fields of art, drama, literature, politics, and sports. We think you will enjoy it. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at this time when Hallmark Playhouse returns to present Van Heflin in Catherine Drinker Bowen's John Adams on the American Revolution. And the week following, Joan Fontaine and Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's Evangeline. And the week after that, Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea on the Hallmark Playhouse. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.